morning everybody. Uh, I don't know if you want it purely English or purely Arabic or Arabic on English. Nima Franco Arab. Okay. It's always been my interest in imaging of the ear. I believe that to become an ear surgeon you have to know imaging really well. And you have to understand the imaging really well. The, the fact is, can we have the lights down a little bit? The lights. So, I believe that uh, imaging is having a map. And this map is for the, uh, for the whole ear. You can't go to a new country without a map. And we all Google everything now. Even maps are on Google. So we have a, a software which is called Google Earth, in which you know all the maps from the Earth. So if you take off the TH here at the end, it becomes Google what? Ear. And if you change the logo of Google Earth and put an ear, so now we can talk about the ear. Very simply, the idea of Google is that you actually get very high resolution photographs from high above. So if you look, for example, Cairo, Egypt on Google, and you look where my university is. This is uh, the Faculty of Medicine in Shams University. This is the university campus of Ain Shams, and this is the, our new hospital, Ain Shams University Hospital. Looks quite small. Let's have a bigger look. Here you get the university hospital, the new hospital. This is the commerce faculty. This is the law faculty. This is the science faculty. This is the head of the university. This is the Faculty of Medicine. And this is actually the whole old hospital campus. We have two big hospitals at Ain Shams University. Let's go bigger and bigger and magnify more and more. You can see the hospital here. You can even see the beautiful design of Ain Shams University Hospital. From the sky, it looks like four big edges. And this was the French when they designed the hospital. They made it like that so that when you get helicopters coming in, flying in patients, they can find it easy. So it looks like four big edges on one big edge. And our temporal bone lab is located on the first floor in this building here. And so we're magnifying this building. Skin can magnify all the way you can see. It's made of three stories. Our temporal bone lab is in this floor down here, in this area. But we can't see down to the first floor because we have the second floor and the third floor. So if we want to go to our temporal bone lab, we have to do something else. We have to destroy the third floor, remove it, remove the second floor to get to the first floor. And this actually has been also done in the military. Because in the military they have satellites, which they can see structures all the way down, and they have missiles by which they can destroy buildings and see down into the buildings. And when we look at our instruments, we actually have a satellite, which is our microscope, and we also have missiles, which is our drill. So we have two ways similar to the military. We can see everything through maps, and we have our drill, but we have to know what we're doing. In the old days, in the Second World War, when they were bombarding Germany, they called it carpet bombing. The planes would go up in the evening, and they would start bombing city after city after city, not making any differentiation between a military factory and a home. But now when they bomb countries, they call it surgical bombing. Surgical bombing because they know their targets. And this is the principle that you must have in ear surgery, that you have to know your target. You have to know that you are going to remove bone lateral to the incus without dislocating the incus and without destroying the facial nerve. So this is what we're going to do, is surgical carving or surgical bombing of the temporal bone. This full uh, uh, lecture, instructional course, is made up of 300 slides, 1,500 images, and it takes approximately seven hours. So we can't do that here, because if we're going to do that, people are simply going to drop dead in the middle of the procedure. So when I do that in Egypt, I usually take this lecture on one full day, and we have coffee breaks in between until we get it all over with. So we're going to take a summarized version of this lecture. 
And we're going to start this lecture by a very simple thing. Everybody's going to look to that slide and say it's very simple. Why did I put this slide? Because at the end of the seven hour lecture, I got one of the residents coming up to me and telling me that you have three words that you keep on saying and I don't understand, which are axial, coronal, and sagittal. And so I put in this slide two years ago because this is a fact. Sometimes we use terminologies that we used to and somebody might be sitting there not understanding this terminology. So when we say axial cut, we mean the horizontal cleft in the human body. And when we say coronal cut, this is a vertical cut along the coronal suture, which is in that way. And when we say sagittal cut, we mean a cut from anterior to posterior. These are the three dimensions of space in the human body. But something very important when we come to talk about the temporal bone, this is not actually the axial cut of the temporal bone. The axial cut of the temporal bone is actually 30 degrees with the horizontal. So it's axial to the temporal bone, not to the what? To the human body. But it has the same meaning. It is a horizontal cut. Let's take our cuts meaning by horizontal and two vertical cuts in the temporal bone. What are we going to ask for, technically wise? Because you are going to get CT scans in the beginning of your career and you find that the radio diagnosis department has given you things that you can't see the ear. And simply because they leave the technician to perform the, the CT scan and you get quality that you can't understand anything of. You have to insist on this sentence. Axial, coronal, sagittal, does it make a difference whether it's one millimeter cut or two millimeter cut? It must be a high resolution CT scan. The bone window is very important and in very simple words, it's like the contrast and the brightness on the TV. So the bone window should be 4,000 over 200, width and level. No contrast is required unless you are suspecting a neoplasm, a glomus tumor, or you're suspecting an intracranial complication. Okay, so there is no need to ask for the soft tissue window. We are going to rely mainly on the bone window to see the structures because we are dealing with a temporal bone. Let's go into business immediately and say that we have nine levels that we are going to describe in the axial, that is the horizontal cut. If we look at this cut, this is the left ear, this is the right ear. You can notice clearly that the mastoid on the right ear is pneumatized, they're air cells. On the left side, it is partially pneumatized. This part of the mastoid is diploid, but it's not pneumatized the same way as the other side. In front here, we can see the temporal mandibular joint. This is the head of the temporal mandible, and this is the joint space. And this is what they call the hamburger side, because it looks like sandwich and hamburger. And then if we look behind it here, this is the cartilaginous external literary canal. Can't see the bony canal because it's a little bit higher. Then here, this is the temporal bone. And in front here is the foramen lacerum, closed off by cartilage. Then in front here, you have the foramen oval and behind it the foramen spinosum. On the other side you find the foramen oval and the foramen spinosum. The absence of the foramen spinosum means that you don't have an artery passing in this foramen spinosum. This means that you most probably are going to have a stapedial artery in the middle here. This is called Phelps sign. Behind the, the foramen oval and the foramen spinosum which are anterior to the temporal bone you find two similar structures. Behind the foramen oval, this is the vertical carotid canal. And behind the foramen spinosum, in the normal temporal bone, you always find an air cell here, between the jugular bulb and the carotid. This air cell in this area is called the crotch air cell, C-R-O-T-C-H. And this crotch air cell has a very important surgical anatomy, surgical importance. Because when you get a glomus tumor, it starts out from the jugular foramen and starts destroying the first thing the crotch air cell. This crotch air cell is actually the base of the styloid process inferior. If you look at the jugular bulb on the left side, it looks like a duck. This is the head of the duck, bata, and you find behind it, this is the body of the duck, and there's the duck bill here, on the other side, the right jugular bulb is quite big. It's uh, sometimes common to find the right side larger than the left side but sometimes they're equal to each other, and I've seen patients in which the left side is larger than the right side, so it's not unusual. And the duck bill here is the inferior petrosal sinus, and the anterior part, the head of the, of, the, of the duck itself, is called the pars nervosa, where you have nine and 10 and 11 cranial nerves, 
And here is the jugular spine, and behind here you find the jugular bulb, which is the beginning of the internal jugular vein from above. And looking at the rest here, you find that these are all the structures in this cut. Let's take just a cut above that. And you're going to see that the bony external auditory canal is going to appear. The middle ear space is right here at the high putempera. We're coming from inferior to superior. And then you see the eustachian tube right here, the beginning of the eustachian tube. Have a look here. You can see the vertical carotid has now been converted to what? To the transverse carotid. And the transverse carotid passes above the foramen lesser, this part, on its way to enter the cavernous sinus and out through to become the two branches of the carotid in the brain. And you can see here a group of crotch air cells which are present right there, three of them, the small crotch air cell which is present here. And if we look at the cut which is higher than that, you will find that there is a dense piece of bone here which has a sort of pushed itself between the jugular and between the transverse carotid. This dense piece of bone here is what we call the otic capsule. And within the otic capsule, right here, on the left side, you can see that there's a very small lumen there, which is dark. Let's talk about the basal turn of the cochlea, because this is confusing. If this is the round window right here, and we have the basal turn of the cochlea coming out from this direction like that, we're talking about the standard cochlea, not the abnormal variance in anatomy. We find that this uh, cochlea passes that inferiorly a little bit, and it's quite a big basal term, and then passes superiorly, and then very high up, and then down again, and makes a complete circle. We are very interested now in the anatomy of the cochlea after cochlear implants. In the past, we would say a cochlea made up of two and three quarters term. And if somebody says two and a half turn, it's accepted. And if somebody says two and a quarter turn, it is accepted. But now we're very interested in the microanatomy of the cochlea. So we call this part the inferior basal turn, and then the ascending basal turn going up, and then the superior basal turn, and then the descending basal turn. And somebody sitting right there is looking to me and said, I've gone crazy. Because how do I call two names with the same meaning? Inferior and basal, they both have the same meaning. Yes, they have the same meaning, but we mean by inferior, inferior in the human body, and basal, basal to the cochlea. Because we have another turn which is within the basal turn, a little bit anterior, called the middle turn. It also has an inferior middle, an ascending middle, a superior middle, and a descending middle. And then we have what we call an apical turn, which is three quarters of a turn. And the apical turn of the cochlea is not dome-shaped from above, which is they open back here. No, it has a flat surface. It is like this ceiling that we have in this room. And this is one of the signs that this cochlea is fully developed, that it has a flat top from the top. It is not dome-shaped. If it's dome-shaped like that, this is an indication that this is an underdeveloped cochlea. So if we take a horizontal cut in the temporal bone, and this is the inferior basal turn, this is going to be my first cut. And then we're going to see the basal turn several times all the way up because we're actually slicing the temporal bone horizontally along the basal turn, which is ver vertical to that plane. So this is the beginning of the inferior basal turn that we can see in this part. A beautiful thing that we can see here is the nice opening of the eustachian tube. And then opposite the basal turn of the cochlea, you see this trumpet-shaped structure. This trumpet shape is a book, and this is called the cochlear aqueduct. The cochlear aqueduct is a continuous tunnel which contains CSF, and this CSF, when it enters into the inner ear, is simply the perilymph, because the perilymph and the CSF are one and the same fluid, and we have one small structure passing through the cochlear aqueduct, which is the petrosal vein, and this drains all the inner ear into the inferior petrosal sinus. Another nice appearance of the duct bill. This is the body of the duct, the head of the duct, and the beak of the duct. And this is a cut you only have just, just missing <coughs> the uh, legs of the duct. And this is quite a high jugular bulb in which the, the jugular bulb is sliced at this level. So it's not seen opening into the jugular vein posterior of the jugular foramen. Let's go higher than that. You can see this is the basal turn of the cochlea. And the beginning of the middle turn starts to appear. This is the basal turn. This is the jugular bulb. And the trumpet-shaped appearance here 
is called the cochlear aqueduct. A nice thing is that this, we call it the cochlear smile, or banana shape, because it looks like a banana, or somebody smiling to you. And this is the eustachian tube, this is the middle ear, this is the external auditory canal. Look here in the back here, you can see this is the suture <coughs> between the occipital bone and the temporal bone. And there's a canal just anterior to the suture, and this canal contains a vein, which is called the mastoid emissary vein, a large vein. When you dissect posteriorly, sometimes it bleeds and becomes quite irritating. This mastoid emissary vein, sometimes when you get lateral sinus thrombophlebitis and chronic otitis media, and a complication of it is lateral sinus thrombophlebitis, you get a bluish coloration and edematous behind the ear, which is called Greisinger's sign. If you get edematous only skin without bluish coloration, this is simply mastoiditis. But the presence of a bluish coloration indicates that you get lateral sinus from flip bites. Let's go higher and see some wonderful anatomy here. This is the basal term of the cochlea, as you can see. And this part here, this set is the scala vestibuli. And in the depth here, this is the, the scala tympani. And it opens posteriorly with the round window. A nice thing about the round window, as you see, is made up of the round window membrane in the depth inside. And there's a mucous membrane fold from the niche to the wall, bony wall here. Many of us, when we start, start working on the round window, we believe that this is the round window membrane. No, the round window membrane is present inside. It is present inside of a cave. The niche is the cover of the cave from lateral, but all this area here is a cave. And this cave has a certain anatomy, a microanatomy that you must know when you do cochlear implants. And then we have the middle turn of the cochlea, and those with very good eyesight can see that there is a small white line in the middle turn of the cochlea, and above it is the apical turn of the cochlea. I knew that this cochlea is fully developed. Why? Because when I looked at the apical turn of the cochlea, I found at the top, is it dome shaped or flat? It is flat. You can see it's flat. And the nice thing is that you can see two horns on the side like that. These two horns, if you look at this ceiling here with the attachment of the wall, and you take a horizontal cut like that, you are going to get these two corners looking like two horns. So if you see these horns, or if you see a flat-topped cochlea from the top, this is an indication that you have a fully developed inner ear and a fully developed cochlea. If you look on the other side, this cut is a little bit higher than this side, and it's beautiful, because you are going to see not, not the round window, the niche of the round window, the round window membrane is inside there, you're going to only see the scalar stimuli and the middle term and the apical term. But if you look in the back here, the back of the middle wall, of the uh, middle ear wall, you are going to see that, first of all, we go in one space here, and then there's a ridge here, and then we have this wide space with a small pyramid inside. Arun just showed us that. He showed us that when you go through, this is the posterior tympanotomy, this is the facial recess, here is the facial nerve, and here is the pyramid where you get the stapedius muscle coming up. So this space is the sinus tympani, and this space is the facial recess. And for the first time, you are going to discover that the sinus tympani is quite a big space if compared to the facial recess. Because we all think that the sinus tympani is a very small space. No, if compared to the facial recess, it's quite a, it's a big space. And at the middle of the round window, you get this structure here, this linear structure, which starts to appear in this space here. Let's look at the higher cut and see what is that. If you look at the higher cut, it looks wonderful here. Now, we are going to see the vestibule, and you are going to see this linear structure is the posterior semicircular canal. Let's have a look at the posterior canal. This is the ampullary end of the posterior canal. This is my hand here. And then the canal goes all the way up to unite with the superior canal. It's quite a large canal. So if you take a horizontal cut here, it's going to appear the ampullary end and the canal itself. If you take a higher cut, it's going to appear as a cross section in the canal. And still a higher cut, you're going to see joining the superior canal. Same way as the cochlea, you take several levels and it's quite a big structure. So if you look here, this is the posterior semicircular canal. And we're going to see here in the middle here the beginning of the appearance of the handle of the magus and behind it the long process of the incus. And if we look inside here, you are going to see this is the antrum of the mastoid, and there is this bony partition here, which is corners septum. 
And if we look into the middle here, this is now the Eustachian tube stop there. There's a space above the Eustachian tube, which is called the supratubal recess. It's anterior to where the ossicles is. The ossicles are in the attic or the epitympanum. So this space has two names, supratubal recess above the Eustachian tube, and we can also call it anterior epitympanum because it is present in front of the handle of the venous. And then here we see this is still the base of term of the cocktail because it's going up now. This is the high part of it. And in front, a small piece of the middle term of the cochlea, and then we can see the internal auditory canal. I like looking at this side here, it's more clear. Let's have a look and revise everything. This is the round window here. So when we go one millimeter above, this is the oval window. And this thin plate of bone here, this is the foot plate of the status. And this is the vestibule and the posterior semicircular canal. This is the internal auditory canal. And this is the basal turn of the cochlea and the middle turn of the cochlea. Can you see this bone inside the basal turn of the cochlea? This is the small pyramidal structure inside the cochlea that we call the modalis, which contains the cochlear nerve spiral ganglia. And then all the way the cochlear nerve comes out from this very small opening at the base of the cochlea, which is the, called the cochlear aperture, sometimes called the lamina foramina cribrosa, in which the cochlear nerve comes out from a cribriform plate. Oh my God, the olfactory nerve comes out through a cribriform plate. The optic nerve comes out through a cribriform uh, tissue. And here we have all these cranial nerves for special senses. They come out from cribriform plates. Why? Because the CSF pressure is high on one side and must become low on the other side. We have something on the Nile River in Egypt that we call it Hawis. What is it Hawis? It's like a small dam in which there are small openings. And you find the water level is high on one side, and this is a way to lower the pressure of the water, to keep the water running slowly, so that it can enter these canals on the side. So this is the same thing. This is a hawis in order to lower the CSF pressure. So if this hawis here is absent. If you look on a CT scan, you find this hawis absent. And you don't see this thin plate of bone. You suspect when you open this cochlea that you are going to get what? A high CSF gusher coming out. When you open the foot plate of the status and step edectomy, you are going to get a gusher. This is the importance of studying the CT scan to find these structures. Look, this is the cochlear nerve coming out from here. And then we find beside it a small canal here. This is where the inferior vestibular comes out and joins the internal auditory canal. What's this uh, gray structure passing right there? This is a gray structure, which is the tympanic part of the facial nerve. And we're going to see it above, and we're going to see the facial nerve several times after that. Well, I'm just showing this CT scan to show you what I mean by apical horns. Apical horns means a fully developed cochlea, as you can see here. And within this cochlea, you can see this modalis. There's the modalis, and this is the base of the cochlea where the cochlear nerve comes out from this position. If we have a look at this nice CT scan, the CT scan can be so accurate <coughs> that it can show you inside the basal turn of the cochlea this ridge of bone, which is a little bit prominent. This is the osseous spiral line, from which is attached the basilar membrane and the ricinus membrane. Let's have a look at a higher level now in the temporal bone. At the higher level of the temporal bone, this is the vestibule here, and attached to it is the lateral semicircular canal. It looks like a ring or a bucket handle, the iligada. And you find behind it, this is the dot. What is this dot? This is the posterior canal on its way up. And this is a section through it. And then there is a small slit-like opening on the side here. The small slit-like opening is the vestibular aqueduct. It must be slit-like and it must be small. Because if it's large, you're going to have a large vestibular aqueduct. And everybody used to believe in the past, when you get a large vestibular aqueduct, this means you have Meniere's disease, a distended sac. No, there's no distended sac in Meniere's disease. When you have a large vestibular aqueduct, this is an indication that this is an underdeveloped cochlea. This is a congenital anomaly in the cochlea. And the last thing to develop in the cochlea is that the large sac becomes small because it has no use now because the cochlea now has a blood supply. So it becomes small and a very small slit-like opening. If it remains wide, this is an indication that this is an underdeveloped cochlea. Let's have a look here. This is the internal literary canal. What a wonderful appearance. Look here. 
There is a facial nerve. This is the labyrinthine facial nerve. The first gene of the facial nerve, the geniculate ganglion, and then the tympanic facial nerve. And in front of it, you can see the greater superficial petrosal nerve. If we go back two slides, and we see that this is the continuation of the facial nerve in the tympanic part of the facial nerve, because we're coming from below upwards. So this is actually the beginning of the tympanic part of the facial nerve. And then you see in the middle ear here, in the attic, you can see the two ossicles. On the other side, they look nice. You can see the head of the bilius, which looks like a ball. And behind it, you can see a triangular bone, which is the incus. And they call that the ice cream cone, because it looks like somebody eating an ice cream on a biscuit, like that. And this is the ice cream cone. I like this ice cream cone very much, because I can know if I have a medius incus dislocation in trauma. Because I find that the distance between the ball and the biscuit has increased. Or I find that the ball has fallen off the cone of the, uh, of the incus. And so you can study incus dislocation nicely. Look here, this looks like an hourglass. And you find this is chorus septum. The residents usually drill a lot of bone here and are so happy to reach this space here. And they're so happy and they say, I've reached the antrum. They haven't reached the antrum. You have to open what? Chorus septum. To open chorus septum, you have to see the dome of the lateral semicircular canal. So by definition, to open the antrum, you have to see the lateral semicircular canal. Let's have a look here. Behind the fissure nerve immediately, there is a small opening for the superior vestibular nerve. We've seen the inferior vestibular nerve. This is superior vestibular nerve. And when Bill House started removing acoustic gliomas through the translabyrinthine approach, he would reach this piece of bone here, this piece of bone. Behind it was the superior vestibular nerve. He would sacrifice. And then in front of it, the fissure nerve, he wouldn't sacrifice. And that's why this bony landmark is called what? Bill's bar. Then, there's a lot of difference between my opinion when it comes to the cog and a lot of other surgeons when it comes to the cog. I believe that the cog, and we're going to see that in a few slides, is this area here where you have the rotation of the fissure nerve from labyrinthine to become what? Tympanic. So if you look at this bone here, this triangular bone, on one side in the internal literary canal it's called Bill's bar. On the other side, between the labyrinthine and the tympanic part, it is called the cog. Some people say that the cog is present from the roof of the attic. Actually, if you follow this bone in the roof of the attic, medially, it's going to become this bone that you see on the CT scan. So we have a lot of discussion about this part, and I insist that this is the cog here that you see, because the cog means it tests, where you have something rotating on the wheel. So this is where the facial nerve rotates around this piece of bone. What's this structure here? Right there, very faint here. It appears here also very faint, just in front of the labyrinthine fish. This is the basal turn of the cochlea. This is the highest part in the basal turn of the cochlea, the most superior part in the basal turn of the cochlea. Now, if we go to a higher cut, it becomes very easy. Now we're getting out of the temporal bone. You're going to see the superior semicircular canal which is in this direction like that. So if you take a cut through it, it appears like two eyes. Snakes. And these two eyes are looking away from each other. So we call them the snake eye appearance because the snake's eye look away from each other. And what's this structure joining it from behind? This is the posterior semicircular canal. And what's this canal passing through the arch of the superior semicircular canal? This is the subarcuate artery, which is a rudimentary artery that sometimes you find in temporal bones or even in patients. Sometimes it's actually functioning with blood inside of it. The highest cut in the temporal bone is going to pass through the arcuate eminence, and you are going to see what the dome of what of the superior semicircular canal. You find that the superior canal differs from the posterior, in that the posterior is along the axis of the temporal bone, the superior is across the axis, it's perpendicular to the axis of the temporal bone, and you see that the lateral semicircular canal appears nicely like a bucket handle in this area. Let's have a, a few look at a few important structures. If we see this is the handle of the magus, this is the head of the magus, and behind it this is the incus, and this is the attic. This is the lateral semicircular canal, the vestibule, the internal literary canal, facial nerve labyrinthine part, geniculate ganglia, tympanic part, 
So P of a stereo nerve and a small Bill's bar right there. Posterior semicircular canal. This is the vestibular aqueduct. And here, this is the highest part of the cochlea. It's nice anatomy. Okay, but why do I put this slide there? In front of the head of the vagus, you find this space. This is above the eustachian tube, so we can call it supratubular recess. And it's anterior in the attic, so we call it anterior epithelium. Why am I laying stress on this space? When you dig out a cholesteatoma from a patient's ear, you dig it out nicely from the, from the mastoid, and then you start getting tired, and you don't know whether you're going to continue as canal wall up or canal wall down. I don't care whatever you do, canal wall up or canal wall down. But please, this is the commonest area where you forget cholesteatoma. And so the patient comes back, not with a recurrent cholesteatoma, but with a residual cholesteatoma. And so this is one of the four spaces in the temporal bone. They all start with the letter S. Supratubular recess, sinus tympani, supra-status uh, suprastructure, and the sinodural angle. They all start with the letter S, and these are the common areas where you forget cholesteatoma. The sinodural angle, because you don't want to drill between the dura plate, and the sigmoid sinus and injure something. The sinus tympani is difficult to see. You have to look with a ZD mirror or with an endoscope. The stapes suprastructure, because you are afraid in, to destroy the stapes and open the oval window and lose the ear. And then the supratubular recess, because you are too tired to reach that area after your surgery. So please, this is the most important of all of them. Never forget the constituent right there. This is another patient in which there is actually a cholesteatoma. You drilled all that out. You've removed the cholesteatoma, and you see this ridge of bone hiding behind it a supratubular recess. And you're getting closer to the facial nerve as well. So you're scared of entering this area. You have to be very careful. And also you're scared because you're afraid to drill into the middle cranial fossa. It's this really sahif place, which is present between the middle cranial fossa dura, the facial nerve in front of the magus, and you're too tired at the end of your surgery. So please make sure that you've cleared always the anterior epithelium. A diploid mastoid is non hematized What's the importance of it? Oh, it's not a problem whatsoever, but you have to be careful. You see where the sigmoid sinus is? It's under the cortex of the mastoid immediately. So when you first put your drill here, you're going to see in front of you what the sigmoid sinus. So how to protect yourself from injury in the sigmoid? Use a large burr. Always when you have a large cutting burr, you find that you're going to run on the sinus without injury. If you're using a small burr, you're going to puncture the sinus. So always use, use a large cutting burr when you find that you have a diploid mastoid. The facial recess, we've seen this before. This is actually where we have the fascia, the uh, uh, reportive penninger, and this is the facial nerve and the stapedius, the facial nerve right here, and the stapedius here. This is the dermid, and this is the space where we enter for the facial recess. Sometimes you can find a group of air cells guiding you, called <coughs> sentinel air cells, like this right here. This is a large sentinel air cell that you can see here. It is present between the corda tympani and the facial nerve and the stapedius muscle. And this is a very nice surgery because once you open this side of the cell, you see that the other side already is in the middle ear, and you see that you've performed your first posterior tympanotomy. Actually, you didn't perform it. God gave you a very nice air cell there called a sentinel air cell. You're all happy when you get temporal bones with sentinel air cells. Be very careful if you have a large sentinel air cell, Sometimes it's going to expose the facial nerve. And when you just open this cell, you find that the facial nerve is exposed inside this cell. So always very good irrigation, and always see where you're drilling. You've opened this cell, look into this cell first before continuing your drilling. So be very careful with sending the air cells. A quick revision of the facial nerve. Let's have a look at it. This is the internal vitreous canal. This is the labyrinthine facial geniculate ganglion, the tympanic fascia. And then behind here, we have the rest of the tympanic fascia, which is covered by bone. You can see within the fallopian canal. On this side here, you can see the rest of the fascia nerve, but it's uncovered. It's not covered by bone. And here you can see the mastoid part of the fascia nerve, because this is not a pneumatized mastoid. You see, this is the sinus tympani, this is the fascia ridge, 
the fascia recess, and right there is the fascia nerve and the mastoid going down. So when you cut it horizontally, it appears like a small circle like that. The good thing about the fascia nerve is that we all are talking about thermal injury of the fascia nerve. And the word thermal means temperature. So all our minds go to heat, because we're using the drill which can heat up the nerve and cause injury to the fascia nerve. I must remind you also, always to tell your nurse when you're irrigating fluid on the uh, patient, you have to remember that the patient's temperature is 37 and that the, 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 uh, uh, the fascia nerve is also affected by cold water. So the water of irrigation must be almost 30 degrees to 35 degrees when you're irrigating. Because once I had a partial fascia nerve paralysis and I didn't know why it happened. Because I only saw a descent fascia nerve which is exposed in the tympanic part, but I drilled very nicely the posterior tympanotum. And this patient recovered after five or six days. And I attributed that to very cold water during irrigation because we were in the winter time at that time. So it's both heat and cold <coughs> that can cause a facial nerve. Bill's bar. Bill's bar is a very large series of bars that is present in the United States. In the United States, you can drink alcohol inside the bar, but you are not allowed to drink alcohol except beer outside the bar. All this area outside here is made up of soft drinks, Cokes, Seven Ups, and things like that. Inside, you get the alcoholic drinks. And this is from the days of the prohibition in the States when the whole of the United States was prevented to drink alcoholic drinks in the 20s and the 30s. It was not allowed for anybody to drink any alcoholic drinks. So this is Bill's Bar. What I'm talking about Bill's Bar is this bar of bone here, which is named after William House. William House, be the law, William, if it states you will read Bill. Say William Clinton, can be read Bill Clinton. This bar, there's a facial nerve anterior, and there is a superior vestibular nerve behind it. And on the other side, the facial nerve rotates, and this is the cock. So this is what we see in Bell's bar. I put these two pictures, one in the temporal bone, and one in the CT scan, and one a schematic drawing of what we need. This is uh, the facial nerve. This is the mastoid facial nerve. This is the second genome of the facial nerve. I'm coming from inferior to superior. This is a right here. This is the uh, second gene. This is the tympanic part of the facial nerve. And this here is the head of the magus. I removed the incus. This is the processus cochleariformis. And this is the first genome of the facial nerve. This looks like this. Okay? This is the first genome of the facial nerve right there. And this is where the geniculate ganglion is. And this is the labyrinthine fish. And then we enter the internal. This is the schematic drawing. This is the mastoid facial nerve, the second genome, and the tympanic facial nerve, the first genome. And this is the cog, where the facial nerve rotates. This is the cog. And then we go down here, we find Bill's bar. This is the logo for Bill's bar. And then we enter the bug. Beside us is the superior what? The stimulant nerve. So now we can understand how the facial nerve is traveling in the ear. And we're going to look at that from different planes, as we're going to see. Let's have a look. This is the tympanic part of the facial nerve here, which is all covered by bone. You know when you get trauma to the temporal bone, this incus sometimes dislocates because it's very loosely attached in the middle ear. A strongly attached bone is the meas. A strongly attached bone is the status. But the incus is attached by mucous membrane folds. So it easily dislocates with the longitudinal <laughs> fracture that passes like that. And then this very large body of the incus hits this very thin bone of the facial nerve and cracks it into the facial nerve. And you get a facial nerve paralysis. All car accidents are like that. The only time a facial nerve is completely cut is by you, by surgeons. But in car accidents, in falling from buildings, in all these types <coughs> of everyday life trauma, the facial nerve either gets cracked bone on it or is stretched. And this is what you find, it never loses its continuity. What, lo what loses the continuity of a facial nerve is the hand drill that you're using during surgery. So you have to be very careful in this iatrogenic trauma. Another facial nerve, the labyrinthine part, the geniculate ganglion, and all this is the tympanic part. And I usually like to see this hump of bone here. 
Because when I see it, when I do cochlear implants, I tell myself, yes, this facial nerve is going to be far from me. I'm going to get a wide tympanotomy when I see this hump of bone. Not like in this situation. See, in this case here, you see the labyrinthine fascia, the genuclein ganglia, and the tympanic fascia, and there's this hump of bone. So I'm satisfied. On this side here, something very strange happened. This is the labyrinthine fascia, this is the tympanic, and then it's moved laterally. So you don't have a hump, but you find it's like a small dome here. This lateral position of the facial nerve during surgery, you will find this facial nerve actually covering the round window of the patient. And this is not going to be easy surgery in this situation. The CT scan can be so accurate that you can see the cochlear nerve coming out from the base of the cochlear, the inferior vestibular nerve coming out at the level of the posterior canal, and you see this very small dark line here. This is the singular nerve, which is the special nerve for the posterior semicircular canal. And there used to be an operation in the past that we stopped doing, is that we destroyed this nerve in benign paroxysmal position of vertite. It was called Gashix operation. And you come beside the round window, just inferior to this level, and you go into this first part of the internal auditory canal, destroying the nerve and you get rather good results, but they stop doing that surgery because of injury to the internal auditory canal. Now we have all these things that we, we've used. We've used the ductal, the smile, the horn, the trumpet, the funnel, the ice cream cone, the bucket head, the dot, the slit, the hourglass, the snake's eye, and the double for the facial recess. We've used all that, but these are all things that try to help us because of the minute structure of the temporal bone. These are very nice names that we have, <coughs> and we should remember, because always when we look at CT scans, we're sitting in the dark, and we don't see uh, our, uh, our stuff, and uh, we get these ideas about uh, different things. Now, we've only finished the axial beds, and everybody's getting very anxious. We only have one hour to see still the corona, and the sagittal, and the MRI. But you see, the first step in seeing the axial cuts is formatting the hard disk of the computer. Now we're just going to put in new software. It's going to be easy because now you know all the anatomy. So what you're going to see, just going to see the anatomy from a different angle. So if we come from anterior to posterior, this is the temporal mandibular joint. This looks uh, like here a shield, which is the styloid process. And here, this is the horizontal carotid. Between them is the uh, inverted triangle of the eustachian tube, and above it is this airspace in the anterior attic, which is the supratubal what? Recess. This is the supratubal recess right there. Let's take a cut behind that. This is the inverted triangle of the eustachian tube, but we've entered the middle ear from its beginning, and some books call this area between the eustachian tube and the mesotympanum, they call this uh, the pro-tympanum. And then if we go to a more posterior, you are going to get this dense bone of the otic capsule, and this is the middle ear space. And within this dense space, you see this small black dot, which is the beginning of the cochlea from anterior, which is the apical turn of the cochlea. And immediately behind it, you are going to see the middle turn of the cochlea, and you are going to see the ascending basal turn on its side. Have a nice look here, you see this bone, which is a partition between the basal turn and the middle turn. This is called the intracochlear partition. On this side, it appears nicely, the middle turn of the cochlea and the ascending base. If you have absence of this partition, this indicates that you have an IP2 malformation, which is a Mundini dysplasia. So this is an underdeveloped. So now we have a flat top cochlea, and we have to look for the other thing, which is a partition between the basal turn and the middle turn. You see these air cells inferior to the cochlea? This is the hypotympanic air cell tract. This is one of the most serious air cell tracts that uh, can actually uh, drive a cochlear implant surgeon into the wrong place. Why into the wrong place? Because they are going to think that this is the round window here, drill all the way here, and put the electrode infracochlear. We have a term in, uh, in Arabic which we call in Nadeha. I don't know if you know it or not. Now that is something from us. Okay? In that when you look inside the middle ear, you find that the round window is concealed by the round window niche. 
sometimes you can't really see it nicely. But then you see, see this very nice hypotepanic cell, and your eye goes to it, and it's calling on you, come here, I am the round window. Start drilling me out and put your electrode here. Don't look up there. Up there, this is not the round window. And this is what we call in that day, because it takes you in the wrong direction. Okay? So always be careful of this air cell tract, which is present inferior to the cochlea. And then we have here, this is the whole basal turn of the cochlea, and this is inside of it, this comma-shaped bone. This is the osseous spiral lemon. You see this black dot here, above here? If you look at it behind here, there are two dots. And let's look at it at the cut after that. You see that they go away from each other. This is the labyrinthine fascia. This is the tympanic fascia. Here is the geniculate area. If I take a vertical cut like that, it's one dot. If I take a cut behind it, there appears two dots. This is going to be the labyrinthine fascia, the medial one, and the lateral one is going to be what? Tympanic one. And they call this whole this structure here, they call it the snail eye. And in front of it, you find the attic. This is the attic. And inside of it here, coming from anterior, is the head of the magus. And sometimes it looks like that. The head of the magus, which part of the handle, looks like a club. And then if you have a smash shuma, which you hit people on their head with, and this looks like a club. And just lateral to it, you find this is the outer attic mass, or the lateral attic wall, and you find this tapered edge coming down from which pars flaccida is attached, part of the tympanic membrane, and they call that what? Schrapnel's membrane. Right? And you find this part of the bone is called what? The scutum. And very early costiatoma do what? They destroy the scutum. But we've always taken this as a sign in CT scan, but alas, it's not a proper sign. Because sometimes costiatoma doesn't arise in this part of the tympanic membrane. It arises in the posterior superior part of the tympanic membrane without destruction of the what? Of the scutum. So destroyed scutum is a good positive sign, but it's not a good what? Negative sign. Let's have a look in the back here. You see this is the rest of the handle of the medius with the incus. And you find this is the basal term of the cochlea. And the two eyes are going away from each other because the labyrinthine is going to join the internal between canal. And this is the internal between canal. And so you have three fingers now, you can see them. The superior semicircular canal above, the lateral canal laterally, and the beginning of the cochlea inferior. And this opening into the middle ear with the thin plate of bone on the floor is the stapes foot plate. And this is the oval window looking laterally. So all this here is the vestibule. This is the internal literary canal. Something really nice about the internal literary canal, if you look inside of it, you find that there is a transverse crest dividing the fundus of the lateral end of the internal literary canal into superior and inferior compartments. Superior anterior, there's the fascial nerve. Posterior, there is the superior vestibular nerve. Inferior anterior, there is the cochlear nerve. And posteriorly is the inferior vestibular nerve and the small nerve that joins the inferior vestibular, which is the singular nerve coming from the posterior semicircular canal. Really, something which is really nice is that underneath the cochlea is the carotid. And then coming from behind, you will find that this is the carotid. Coming from behind and lateral is the jugular. And then after a certain situation, it only becomes the jugular. And the jugular here, there's a thin plate of bone. You can look through the middle ear. If you adjust your microscope and remove part of this bone like that, you can see the jugular plate of bone, which looks bluish in color. Rest you find the vestibule, the superior semicircular canal, the lateral canal, and then the other window, which is the round window. See how the round window looks inferior. And in order to see the membrane, you have to remove this edge of bone here, or to see the membrane. Let's have a look after that. There's a nice canal here going down. This must, must be the mastoid fascia nerve. Is that right? Let's look at the next cut after that. We find, oh God, there are two canals. One of them is right here, and another one, and there's another opening here with a small canal. And let's have another, oh God, there are three canals now. There's the one that we saw first here with a big structure. There's one lateral to it with a smaller structure and a very small short canal. What are these three canals there? The one in the middle with the big structure is the stapedius muscle canal. And the one lateral to it coming out from the stylomastoid form in here, this is the facial nerve canal. And the one medial to it in the depth here coming from the jugular foramen 
traveling all the way to the middle ear, is a small canal for a nerve from the ninth cranial nerve, which is uh, Jacobson's nerve, or the tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve. Finally, we are going to see the last structure, which is here, the superior canal from behind, the posterior canal from behind, the cross commune, and just anterior to them by half a millimeter are the two openings of the lateral semicircular canal. And if we have a look at the last cut here, we are going to see this inverted J-shaped structure. This opens into the posterior fossa and the sac. This is the endolymphatic duct, which is present within the vestibular aqueduct. This vestibular aqueduct and the axial cut look like a slit-like opening. In the coronal cuts, it's an inverted shape, and it's very, very narrow. Everybody thinks this is the posterior semicircular canal. No, the posterior canal does not open what? Into the posterior fossa. So this is uh, the vestibular aqueduct. A few things that are really nice. Here you can see the cochlear partition, and the labyrinthine facial and the tympanic facial, the middle cochlear turn and the basal cochlear turn. This cut here is behind the first one. So this one shows the whole basal turn and the osseous spiral lamina within it. Okay? So this is the whole basal turn here. This is the basal and the middle turns. This is really, let's revise the whole facial now. This is the geniculate ganglia. Behind it, the labyrinthine and the tympanic. And here, the labyrinthine on its way into the internal literary canal. This is the oval window here, and this small gray spot is the fascia nerve, the tympanic part above the oval window. This is the lateral semicircular canal like that, and this is the small fascia nerve above the oval window. This is another oval window like that with the fascia nerve above it and the lateral canal right here. This is a very nice structure where you can see the fascia, the stapedius muscle and the fascia nerve. And then here you can see this is not really a coronal cut. It's a little bit of an oblique sagittal cut where you have the second genome of fascia nerve, and then you have the vertical fascia nerve. And this cut, sometimes you can see, where you see the fascia nerve and it's branched the cord of what? Tympani. So you can see the cord of facial angle here, and you can assess the size of your tympanotomy from a cut like that. <coughs> now, the fascia nerve here, you can see, this is a sagittal cut just above the oval window here. This is the second genome of the fascia nerve. The tympanic fascia is coming from here. The second genome, this is the lateral semicircular canal, and this is the mastoid fascia. Why do I put this cut? Because you're going to expose the fascia nerve in the temporal bone. And you're going to find that the lateral semicircular canal forms a small bone. So sometimes you have to shave off bone without injuring the lumen of the canal, flatten the canal very gently in order to see the second genome of the fascia nerve. This is the lateral <coughs> semicircular canal, the second genome, and the mastoid fascia, and this is the second genome of the facial nerve. This is a, a cut, which is the whole cochlea, and this is the superior canal, this is the lateral canal, and this dot here between the cochlea and the vestibule, this is the labyrinthine or facial. This is a beautiful cut. You see here, this is the cochlea, this is the tympanic membrane here, this is the uh, pars tensor, and this is the pars flas. This is the scuter, this is the handle of the magus, the neck of the magus, and the head of the magus. This is the attic with the superior malleolar ligament, and this is the tympanic fascia. This is the labyrinthine fish. Does anybody know what this structure, gray structure, inferior to the tympanic fish is? The structure right there. Anybody have an idea what it is? And there's something very small coming out from it and attached to the neck of the leg. Sensor tympanoid muscle. So you can see into the ear, into very small structures. All these are names also that we give to the different structures in the coronal view. The siphon is where the carotid turns around, the inverted triangle, the snail's eye, the club, the taper tip, the three fingers, the transverse ridge of the crest. And the spade looks like the round window when it's inverted, the inverted J. And the cane, which looks like the fissure nerve, which looks like al asal al wahd bin cane. Sagittal cuts. New software, very easy software. Why didn't we start with sagittal cuts? Because the radiologists didn't give us this work. The machines only showed axial, so we started the axial. But when you look to the sagittal cut, oh my god, this is the surgical view. When you're sitting on the patient, doing your ear surgery, you're looking at what plane? The sagittal plane. 
So if they gave us this in the beginning, we would never have studied the axiom of the chrome. Because this is very easy. You can see the tympanic ring. This is the part that I would want to mention. When you remove it, you're going to see the carotid. You're going to see the jugular. Here you can see this is uh, the uh, stapedius and this is the facial nerve. This is the magus. This is the incus. This is the attic. This is the antrum. The lateral semicircular canal in the antrum. The bulge of the lateral canal. This is the whole mastoid. So it looks like the old mastoid x-rays, but it's more refined and appears more nicely. If we look at the round window in particular, the microanatomy of the round window is very important. Look right here. This is the oval window, okay, with the foot plate of the stings and the round window right there. See how close the round window to the oval window is from inside? But because of the round window niche out there, they look as if they are far away from each other. But this is something covering the round window, so that you don't get a baffle effect. So that's why you have this round window need. And then there's a mucosal fold right here. There's a cave here that you have to understand nicely, because if you drill wrongly in there, you can hit the high jugular bone, or you can go into the internal uterine canal. And here you find the attachment of the round window <coughs> brain, and you can see here this hook-like structure. It's called the crista fenestra. The most irritating thing in cochlear implant surgery. You've done a very nice round window approach. You've entered and you've seen the skeleton pain. And when you put it, put in your electrode, it becomes entangled and thick. Because this looks like a hook, hot off. It, it, it catches the, the, the electrode. I always like to look into the round window and maybe drill out part of this hook from this part here to make it very smooth so that I don't get troubles when inserting my electrodes. Sometimes the hook appears on the axial cut like a high original bone, bone as we can see here. Can we see the status in CT scans? Yes, sometimes we can. As this arch of the status and the head of the status with the lenticular plus, you can see it here within this ear with OME, with the type of medium diffusion. Can we see a lot of structures in this sagittal cut? Yes, beautiful structures. Now, I have to be very careful because I'm going to put another slide right now and I'm going to ask everybody to repeat the structures again because I like this cut very nice. This is the cochlea right here. This is the jugular bulb. And this is the inferior petrosal sinus on its way to the cavernous. This is the fascia nerve between the cochlea and the superior semicircular canal. This is the vestibule. This is uh, the superior semicircular canal. This is uh, the lateral semicircular canal. This is the second geo of the fissure nerve. This is the open window here and the round window right there. You see, this looks like a bird with the an archetype bird, the eyes, the mouth, were off the of a wood for a bird for rust. And so this looks like the head of a bird right there. So these are the structures. And this is the antrum of the mastoid. Let's ask you two or three structures here and please reply. What's this dot here between the cochlea and the superior canal? Yeah, yeah, the fish yeah. What's this structure all the way here? Yeah, it's it's the the side. What is this space right there? I didn't say it. But where the over window opens and the round window opens, this is the middle ear what yeah. space. And right there is the antrum. So we're cut, cutting through here. And this is the second genome fish nerve. And the mastoid fissure, what is this structure here? Yes, That's the semicircular canal and all this space here. Where the oval window opens and the round window, this is the vestibule. Okay? So this is really a nice cut that you see a lot of things. Can you see here the fissure nerve and its branch, the corner to Yes. It's very nice here. And this is the posterior canal and this is the superior canal. Okay. This is a marvelous cut. Let's have a look here because there's something in the anatomy that's very irritating in the cochlea. What's this irritating thing? If you look at this cochlea here, which is sagittally cut, this is the internal uterine canal. This is the lamina fibrosa where the nerve comes out. If you take the base of this cochlea and the apex of the cochlea and you draw a line from the mid base to the mid apex, this is the geometric axis of the cochlea. But the modalis is not in the position of the geometric axis. It is superiorly placed. So the cochlea, if you take it geometrically, and the same, is directed inferior. But the modalis is directed what? Within the cochlea, superior. When you introduce the electrode, you introduce it along 
the geometric axis or the modular axis? Yeah, modular axis. So you have to be careful because your mind is fixed on the geometric axis. So when you put the electrode into the cochlea in the left ear, you actually push it downwards and it's going to kink. You have to remind, mem remind yourself that this cochlea, the modular axis is superior. So actually the cochlea is like a wash and you're moving clockwise in the left ear. And in the right ear, you're moving what? Anti-clockwise. You're not going down at the depth. But of course, we have variants here. We have the posteriorly rotated cochlea. We have the axially rotated cochlea. But these are not common. So you have to always keep in mind this CT scan, where this is the geometric axis, and this is what the modular axis during introduction of the electrode. This is a very nice cut that Arun mentioned right now in the anatomy. You remember when he did with his hand like that and said the facial nerve and the stapedius crossing the facial nerve? This is beautiful. This is the facial nerve right here. Second gene and mastoid fish. Agreed? The branch coming out from down there going to the middle ear is what? The corda tympanum. So all this space is what? Is the facial recess. It's posterior tympanum. And then you find this structure which is crossing the facial nerve going to the pyramid. This is what he is. Stapedius muscle. So that's what he was saying, that if you are going to try and expose the stapedius in this point, at this crossing point, you are going to hit what? The facial nerve. And if you want to expose the stapedius in this point, you have to go all the way back here. So you're going to hit who? The facial nerve. So this is a cut when he was just explaining that right here. I remembered this cut. I had my laptop on my lap and I just showed it. It was hidden. I didn't show it. I thought it was too complicated. And I said, no, this is going to explain what exactly what he means by killing the facial nerve if you try to find the stapedius muscle. Now, first time I gave this lecture at my department, I was banned from teaching. They banned me from teaching. And they said he must go and sit at home and no, not teach any longer. Why? Because I used all this terminology, cochlear smile and uh, club and snail's eye, snake's things. They said he's teaching the guys, the residents, wrong terminologies. And they're talking a very strange language. So they banned me from teaching from three, three years. And I had to prove to them that all what I was saying was correct. So I went to the literature and got evidence for each term that I mentioned. And this was the oldest evidence that I found was in the radiologic clinics of North America, December 1974. At that time, I was in Tel Tadeh, third preparatory, and I didn't imagine I would be an ENT doctor. So this means that all this was before my days even. And I'm using all terminologies that are present in what? In the literature. After showing my evidence, they brought me back to teach again for postgraduates. Because in the beginning, they thought I was just saying crazy things. Let's go quickly to MRIs. MRIs are really nice because you can see everything in the MRI. We want the T2-weighted image because the inner ear and the internal auditory canal contain what? Fluid. Uh, as we say in Egypt, we want to see immediately the T2 images. And we have the T1 and the T1 with contrast only if we are searching for tumors, suspecting intracranial complications or so. You see the beauty of the MRI? White now. We see everything in white. So we have to see as if we see the opposite way. This is the basal term of the cochlea, the middle term, and the flat-topped apical term with the basal, with the modulus. And here is the vestibule, the lateral canal, and the posterior canal, and the internal auditory canal. See the coronal cut here? This is the whole basal term all the way. Remember when I showed it inferior basal, ascending basal, superior basal, descending basal, and then the middle term, and then the apical term, the lateral semicircular canal, and the superior canal and the internal uterine canal. This dark line here, this is actually the facial nerve. This is a more close-up look on the whole terms of the cochlea. And I'm going to sort of summarize everything in this slide. You see, I put an axial MRI here. And I've imagined that we are taking uh, 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 vertical cuts, coronal cuts like that and see what comes out in the CT scan, these are CT scans. Coming from anterior, you see the apical term, and then so, and then so, and then so, and then so. And then you see this coronal cut right there? This is coronal, MRI. 
I'm going to take axial cuts, horizontal cuts, from inferior to what? To superior. And I'm going to get these cuts here. Inferior basal term, then the basal term will part of the middle, and then so with the round window, and then the osseous part of that, and then the higher part of the basal with a little bit of the middle, and then the higher most part of what? Of the basal term. So this puts everything in 3D view for you. This very nice slide. The internal literary can you can see into it. You can see the dark line of the cochlear nerve, and behind it the inferior vestibular nerve. And very good eyesight can see this other dark line, which is the singular nerve. In this coronal cut, you can see the facial nerve above and the cochlear nerve, this dark, large nerve inferior to it. And if we look into the new MRI machines, which are not ready for humans, the, the, the experiments have been done on temporal bones only. You see the quality of the MRI. You can see into the cochlea. You can see the basilar membrane. You can see the scala media, the scala vestibuli, the scala tympani. This is going to be of great importance when we do cochlear implants and ossified cochleas. We can understand where the obliteration is. We can help the patient better. These are very good MRIs that are going to be in the market very soon and we're going to see into the cochlea. The nice thing about the MRI is that they give you a CD with all the pictures and you can flip the cochlea around on your computer. And then you can understand the anatomy. Why is this cochlea, for example, posteriorly placed? Why is it too high? Why is it inferior? Because there's no cochlea similar from one patient to the other. As cochlear implant surgeons, I always go into every patient studying the direction of the cochlea, the lumen of the cochlea. Sometimes you find it small, especially in these kids with deafness. You have structural anomalies that you have to see very nice on a 3D view of the MRI. Here are the lateral semicircular canal, the posterior canal. This is a view from behind and the superior canal from above. And we can see also structures like the cochlear aqueduct, the trumpet shape, the facial nerve. Can we see the facial nerve in MRI? Only when it has water on it, when it is edematous. So this must be a patient with what? With Bell's palsy, because this is an edematous nerve. But you can't see a normal nerve in an MRI. You can see it with extreme difficulty. Here is the back, here you can see the two endolymphatic ducts. And here is the union of the superior canal with the posterior canal in the cross from you. The internal auditory canal, now we can see into the internal auditory canal. You see this sagittal cut, this is the cerebellum. This is the temporal lobe, this is the internal auditory canal. Above right there is the facial nerve. Here is the superior vestibular. Down here is the cochlear nerve. This small faint drop, dot there is the inferior it was an uh, inferior uh, vestibular nerve. You see this uh, patient here? This is a patient who has the four nerves there, and the same patient who has two nerves on one of them sticking to the anterior wall. No, it's different. It's different inside the canal. If you have your slice in the lateral part of the canal, you have four nerves. In the mid part of the canal, you have three nerves. In the medial part of the canal, you only have two because the cochlear nerve unites with the vestibular nerve, and then the two vestibular nerves unite with each other. And we're going to see that quite clearly here. For example, sometimes I give uh, in, the, in the exams an MRI picture like that. And I tell the candidate, assess the nerves in the internal auditory canal. And the candidate starts looking and said, I can't find the internal auditory canal. The picture is too big, because you always showed us in the lecture the zoom in on the internal auditory canal. So when you look for it, it's very easy. There's the cerebellum, and tear to the cerebellum, behind, below the temporal lobe, there's the internal auditory canal. So you zoom in with your eyes on this area, and you magnify it, and you see that you have one, two, three, four nerves. So this is a patient with a vestibular cochlear nerve, which is there. Because after doing cochlear implants, we had this big surprise. Some of our patients didn't respond to cochlear implants, and then we found out that they don't have a vestibular cochlear nerve. They were patients with cochlear nerve aplasia. And this is like somebody who has the computer there, but without the, the data cable. So you can't do a cochlear implant in that patient. You have to do a brainstem implant. So that's very important. The first thing I do now is whenever I see a patient for a cochlear implant, I look for the nerve, the first thing. I have to check. I don't care about the inner ear. Because sometimes they have a fully developed inner ear without a cochlear nerve. So you have to look to the cochlear nerve. And this is how the internal auditory canal looks. So somebody might forget this one of those days. So you have the fissure nerve, which is anterior and up. 
So it's called seven up, so that you don't forget it. Okay? And then underneath it, you have the cochlear nerve. It's like Coca-Cola, so you don't forget. And then this is Bill's bar. We know that everything anterior in Bill's bar are soft drinks, is that right? Outside of the street, they drink soft drinks. But right in the back here, we have superior vestibular nerve, sky vodka. And this is the Ukrainian vodka, inferior vestibular nerve. No, these are alcoholic drinks. And when patients drink these uh, vodka drinks and alcoholic drinks, they lose balance. So that's why they are inside in the bar, not outside. And then you have a small pharmacy where you have the, the singular nerve, and the singular nerve is from the posterior semicircular canal. So this is just a schematic drawing to remember. And this, of course, divides the fundus of the internal ischemic canal. This is the transverse crescent to a superior compartment and an inferior compartment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we have the fissure nerve, we have the cochlear nerve, and you see the two vestibular nerves, they started to unite with each other. Here in this axial cut you have the fascia nerve, the superior vestibular nerve, and below it you have the cochlear nerve and the inferior vestibular nerve. What is this structure here that loops in? This is the anterior inferior cerebellum artery, the ICA. And you get from it a small branch. You see this dark line here? Very small dark line. This is the labyrinthine what? artery, which is an end artery. And this artery is the one, if you have an acoustic neuroma here, which is very small, and then suddenly there is hemorrhage inside of it, and it compresses the labyrinthine artery, the patient gets a sudden sensory neural hearing loss. Because 10% of cases, of acoustic neuroma present by sudden sensory neuroma. Oh, this, this is really nice. Look at here, this is the cochlea in the back. These are the semicircular canals. This is the internal literary canal. You see how big it is? It's the size of the external literary canal. I put it with the cochlea in the back so that you understand the relationship between both of them. And then if we take a lateral cut in the axial or a lateral cut in the corona, here you are going to see four nerves. Cochlear, fascia, superior, inferior vestibular. In the mid part of the canal, you are going to see three nerves. Fascia, cochlear, and vestibular. In the medial end of the canal, coming out of the canal, you are going to see two nerves, which are who? Fascia and vestibular cochlear. But you never find one nerve. If you see one nerve, this is an anomaly. This is only a facial what? Nerve. The patient does not have a vestibular cochlear nerve. Now, we are going to have, uh, I've put both lectures together. Can you take a break and continue after? Uh, this is going to take exactly 15 minutes. Okay? I want it so that everything sinks now. We're doing a mastoidectomy right now, okay? So we've seen everything in the map, in Google map. Now we are using our missiles now. We are destroying the boat to see the structure. Now, the first line we are going to, and this is a right ear along the temporal line, and the second line on the back of the, posterior, of the external literary canal. And now we've opened the antrum, and if we suck, you can see the dome of the lateral canal right there. And something very nice, every time I suck, there's something white there that appears with the water and disappears when I suck the water. This is the incus. This is the water sign of the incus, something really nice that shows and appears uh, ins inside the bone. Uh, it's because of refraction of the light. So you see the incus before you actually see it. You see it through the water first. Now I've drilled the belly of digastric here. This is the digastric muscle, this soft area. And this is the, the digastric ridge. The fascia nerve does not co come out at the digastric ridge. Actually, it comes out a little bit more medial to the digastric ridge. So always if you're lateral to the digastric, you don't carry the chance of injuring the fish. The step I'm doing right now, I'm removing <coughs> bone lateral to the incus. <coughs> I like to expose the body of the incus. See how I've thinned the canal wall? This canal wall is really thin. You keep on removing bone until the air cells disappear. And it's very thin, but try not to break it. Because the biggest problem in cochlear implants if you break it. This is the lateral semicircle. No, sorry, this is the incus here with the malleus in front of it. This is the anterior epicanthus. 
Now this is the short course of the incus and the lateral canal, and I'm drilling along the posterior tympanotomy. You see how the suction is close to the drill, and the water is coming down, and your suction is close to the drill and a little bit higher, so that you can see through the clear water, but at the same time, you don't have to stop drilling. I always know a good surgeon by my ears, going behind the tables and temporal bone left. If I hear somebody drilling in, 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 in like that, this is a good surgeon. If they drill in, 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 this means he's not yet confident. If they drill like that, in, hold that suction, and then one in, and then several suction, I say this is, will never be a surgeon. Okay? So please be careful when you drill. You see here, drilling into the posterior tympanotomy, and now you see this white line that's going to appear here. See this fissure nerve short courses points to the fissure nerve. It points right there to the fissure nerve. These are sentinel cells that have been opened now. And now you're going to see the chorda tympani. You see this white structure? I'm showing. Sure. And the fissure nerve is going to be right there. This is the incus buttress. And this is the short course of the incus within the fossa incubus. You can see into the whole attic here. Drill onto the fissure nerve. You see the air cells here? These are sentinel air cells. This is the chorda tympani. And in the back here, this is the mastoid fissure. And the air cells there, these are what? The sentinel air cells. Very nice surgery. You're working on a bone, so you shouldn't be afraid. Gently, good irrigation. And keeping this incus buttress, you see the short process, when you take a line like that, points to the fissure. Always be careful with the lateral semicircular canal because we have this belief that the fissure nerve is deeper always to the lateral canal. No, when you go inferior, the fissure nerve comes out like that. And so this short process points to it. So always be careful with this one. This is where the residents kill the fissure nerve. Because they always tell me, the fissure nerve should be lateral to canal. This is an anomaly. Why is the fissure nerve coming up more superficial? It's normal like that. The fissure nerve becomes more superficial at this point. And it becomes more superficial, becomes at the same level as the lateral semicircular canal, and then it's going to become what? More superficial. So always keep your eye where the incus points. That's why always keep the incus in position. Because when you drill this bone out there, some of you hit the incus, and it changes its direction. And so you're lost. The incus is the most important landmark. Now I'm going to open into the recess, into the uh, fissure recess. You see now, if I remove bone from behind the fissure nerve, lateral to the fissure nerve, and then anterior to the fissure nerve. This is Jacobson's nerve. You see it on the promontory there, this white structure. This is the incubus tapedial joint. This is the stapes muscle, the stapedius muscle. And this is the pyramid right there, pyramidal eminence. This is the stapedius, the pyramidal eminence. And this is the fissure nerve. You can almost see the nerve inside the bone. You can almost see the coda timpani in its part right there. Now I've pushed it into the middle. Place. I'm removing bone from anterior <coughs> to the fascia to see the round window niche. There's the round window niche. And if I move, you see the nadeha down there. There's the crazy air cell that calls on you and tells you, come right here, dig for your cochleostomy. No, this is the round window here. Don't look down there. It's calling on you. Okay? And so this must be the basal turn of the cochlea and the promoter. I've removed the mucous membrane fold on the round wind. So we have the chorda tympani, the facial nerve, and this is the posterior tympanotomy. And I like removing this angle piece of bone here. I like removing also some bone lateral here because it brings in light. Remember in the fascia recess, you have to bring in your instruments and you have to bring in light to see. So you shouldn't have anything shadowing like the posterior canal wall must be very thin. And looking into there, you find sometimes shadows. And so you can't see into the middle here. Always bring in light. Open up these angles here. Be very careful at this angle because the facial nerve is coming right there. This is the incubus tapedial joint right there. And the stapeg and the head of the stapes and the stapegus and the pyramid. There's the foot plate of the stapes. When you dig up your bone, spend time. You see, see how I 
there's a shadow down there because I didn't drill this part of the canal nicely. I have to thin it out so that I can bring light into the middle here. This is the round window. And I've put, I've stuck my needle into the niche. And there's the hypotympanic air cells calling on it. There's the Jacobson's nerve. And anteriorly right there, you're going into the eustachian tube. I've done a cochleostomy in this patient, as you can see. But now the most important thing, I'm exposing the fascia nerve. You can see the short process of the incus points to the fascia. There's the fascia. I've exposed the fascia in this part. And I'm removing bone on the lateral canal, very gently without opening the lumen of the lateral semicircular canal, because if you open it, you've destroyed it. So you just remove bone until you see a line which is inside the bone. It's like a blue line. And then start removing bone on the facial nerve. Which parts of the facial nerve you're going to remove from the back of the facial nerve, lateral to the facial nerve, and anterior. This was, Arun was saying, barber pooling, زي الحلقين. And then in America, there is the الحلقين of the to lift it. فنفس الفكرة بتاعتها you remove bone posteriorly and then laterally and then inferior on the facial nerve. Do you see the burr I'm using on the facial nerve? What do you think of it? Is it too big? It must be a big burr because if it's a small burr, it's going to puncture the canal. I want to use a big burr, it's safer. It uses lesser. Energy. You see now I've, I've I've dissected all the way down. This is the digastric ridge. See where the fissure nerve is? It is medial to the digastric ridge. It's not at the tip of the digastric ridge. It is medial to the digastric ridge. And I'm going to come out through the what? Stigomastoid form. You see this area is soft now. I've reached the stigomastoid form. This is the chordative pinny nerve. Does anybody know what this nerve is? Another branch from the fascia inside the temporal bone. Stapedius muscle? No, it takes it from the medial aspect. You can't reach it. This is a small sensory nerve that goes to the skin of the posterior canal wall and part of the conca, and it carries the, fa the name of the famous neurosurgeon that worked with ENT in neuroautology, which is Bill Hitzelberger. And so it's called Hitzelberger's nerve. You see how you have to expose the facial nerve is inside of a canal. To decompress the nerve, you don't just see the nerve. You have to remove bone from three quarters of the canal. You have to see the facial nerve bulging into your face. Three quarters of the circumference of the nerve must be exposed. And then remove the small chips of bone from the surface of the facial nerve. Never remove the nerve, the, these pieces of bone, by pressing down on the nerve. It causes more damage. So you just put your instrument underneath the very thin chip and you sort of tear it away like that. That's the matter to push it down. No. Just pick up the bone and remove the bone from the fish. Now I'm using a smaller bird. I'm exposing the tympanic part. There's a very thin piece, and this is the geniculate ganglion right there. And this is the incus. This is the long process, the short process, the body of the incus. And all that I was able to do without removing what? The incus. But this is not always the case. In some patients, it's very difficult. You have to remove the incus and put it back. So this is just, I'm bragging about I can do that. But I must say, honestly, that sometimes I can't do it. I have to remove what? The incus. And then here we have the status. This is the lateral canal. This is the short process. I removed the incus buffers. This is the mastoid fascia with the chorda tympani. and the stylomastoid form down there. What do you think about the facial nerves? Is it a small nerve? It's a big nerve. Because when you start draining the bone as beginners, you might see every structure and say this is the facial nerve. This is the second genome and then all the way down to the what? To the geniculate ganglion. In this other video right here, we are going to dissect into the inner ear. You're going to see this is the lateral semicircular canal. This is the posterior canal, and down there in the depth is the superior canal. And this is the mastoid facial nerve. This is the processus cochlearyformis. This is the head of the manus. And this is the tegment plate. Now, 
I've drilled out the lateral canal, show the lumen of the canal, I'm doing a labyrinthectomy. And then I drilled out the superior semicircular canal and the posterior canal. You see the crust of you is right there. This canal has two separate openings. The superior canal has a common opening with the posterior. I drilled out all the canals now, and I'm looking into the vestibule. I've even drilled out the medial wall of the vestibule. This is the first gene of the facial nerve. This is the labyrinthine fascia. And going into there, this is Bill's bar. And up there is the cob, where the facial nerve rope turns around. This is the mastoid fascia. So you see the whole fascia. Mastoid, second gene, tympanic, first gene, labyrinthine, internal uterine canal. Let's say it the other way around. Internal uterine canal, labyrinthine, first genome, second genome, uh, tympanic part first, and then second genome, and then mastoid facial nerve. You can see the whole facial nerve in this temporal bone and orient yourself. I am cheating here. What am I doing? I am getting my satellite, my microscope, and looking from above. Because I want to show you the cog here. But if I am in the proper position, this labyrinthine fascia is behind the tympanic. Just imagine, in the normal position in the patient, the labyrinthine is what is behind the tympanic fascia. But because I want to show this, I got my microscope tilted a little bit superiorly, looking downwards. OK? Now, I'm going to shift the satellite, and this is the last few slides. We're going to look from above from above the temporal bone, from another, not from the lateral aspect of the temporal bone, but from above. So if you look from above, this is a picture from Ralph Nelson's manual. You see the greater superficial petrosal nerve, you see the geniculate ganglia, you see the tympanic, and you see the labyrinthine fascia, and coming out from the internal uterine canal, and here's the superior vestibular with the Bill's bar right there. And this is a left ear. Okay? Let's have a look at this picture here. This is also a left ear, this is anterior, this is posterior, this is the, the superior petrosal sinus at the petrosal ridge, this is the roof of the temporal bone, this is the arcuate eminence, and this is the great superficial petrosal nerve, this white structure here, this is the middle meningeal artery, and these are the branches of the trigeminal nerve, the ophthalmic, the, maxi the uh, maxillary, and the mandibular. Let's have a look at what we're going to do. First of all, we're going to draw a line at the greater superficial petrosal nerve and another line at the superior semicircular canal. And bisect this angle. This angle here, we're going to bisect it. And when we bisect it, we're going to imagine what's in the underneath. So here is the vestibule. Anterior to this line is the cochlea. And this is the corridor where the facial is going to pass through here. Where is the internal uterine canal? This is the internal uterine canal. All this is dotted. We haven't seen it. And then here is the facial nerve, and behind it is what? The superior vestibular nerve. So this bone here is Bill's what? Bar. And this bone right here, because the facial nerve is going to go back like that, is the cog. In your opinion, which is the safest area to enter the internal uterine canal? You can either follow fascia, but carry the risk of destroying the cochlea or the vestibule, because this is placed very narrow. But if you follow the fascia, you can do it, because you can see the greater superficial petrosal, go backwards like that, and then like that. But maybe you're going to go backwards like that, or maybe you're going to go backwards like that. So you get lost. So you have to be very careful when following the nerve. But the safe way to enter this internal uterine canal is from here, from this area here. This is called the safe triangle. And this is Mario Sanna's technique, to go from posteriorly into the canal. So what are we going to see? I've removed all the bone. I made it quite easy. You're going to see this is the internal uterine canal. This is the labyrinthine fascia. This is the geniculate ganglia. This is the greater superficial petrosal. And this right here is the tympanic fascia, the superior canal, and this is the vestibule with the openings of the lateral canal. This is the cochlea here, these uh, a basal turn and the middle turn. You can see even see into the basal turn. And this is the middle ear. This is the head of the magus. This is the corner tympana inside the middle ear. 
This is the anterior supratubular recess, anteriorly different. And down there in the depth there, this dark area, is the eustachian tube. We're looking from above. So we have an anatomy, a bird's eye view. Let's zoom in. Zooming in, we're going to find the geniculate ganglion, the greater superficial petrosal nerve, the labyrinthine fissure, the internal lytic canal fissure, and the tympanic fissure going into the middle ear. You remember the CT scan with this view? Looks exactly like it. The internal lytic canal right there, and here we have the vestibule, and here we have the cochlea. How about zooming in more? Seeing into the cochlea, this is the basal turn of the cochlea. This is the middle turn of the cochlea. In between them, you have the osseous spiral lamina. And then you have coming out here is the facial nerve. I've taken it with the dissector to the side. And this is the facial nerve. And then here we have the cochlear nerve down there, inferior to the fascia. And then inside there, I've taken the superior vestibular nerve with the dissector. You can see the inferior vestibular nerve right there. Let's look into the cochlea. This is the modalis. This is the scala tympani, the osseous spiral lamina. Above it, the scala vestibuli. The same thing, scala tympani and scala vestibuli in the middle cochlear turn. Looking, also zooming into the internal uterine canal. This is the facial nerve. This is the superior vestibular nerve. And this is the singular nerve coming down there from the back. Now I've taken the fish and the superior vestibular to the side, so I see the cochlear nerve coming out from the base of the cochlea, the inferior vestibular nerve in the back, and this is part of the superior vestibular nerve. And I've taken all the nerves anteriorly and shown what the singular nerve in the back there. Three minutes video. I'm going to remove this edge of bone on the temporal bone from above and look onto the roof of the temporal bone greater superficial petrosal and superior semicircular canal, superior canal, arch, and greater superficial petrosal nerve. And here we have the superior petrosal sinus in the petrosal ridge and the trigeminal nerve branches in the Meckel's cave. So this is uh, our war zone. <coughs> this is the internal uterine canal right there. And I'm going to enter it from posterior. <coughs> How to identify this ridge right there? It's quite difficult sometimes because you have a lot of ridges on the bone. It's the last ridge before the superior petrosal sinus. Now, if we look right there, we can see the internal uterine canal. This is the cochlea. This is the vestibule, and this is the open internal uterine canal. Labyrinthine fascia, Bill's bar, superior vestibule. This is Bill's bar right there. And we have the great ganglion, and we have the tympanic fascia. Zoom in. The cochlea, you can see the different color of the bone of the cochlea. It's ivory different from the yellow bone of the temporal bone. Well, this whole thing is the geniculate ganglion, labyrinthine facial, interlocutory canal fissure. It's a very, the labyrinthine facial passes through a very small canal. It is 0.6 millimeters wide and it is four millimeters long. That's the petrosal ridge, labyrinthine facial and tympanic fissure. Cochlea. Scala tympani, scala stibuli, inside there the modalis, <coughs> middle turn also scala tympani, scala stibuli. Did you notice the black dots that you see inside the cochlea? Can somebody explain to me how we can get black dots inside the cochlea? That's melanin. Melanin is only for the skin. Because the cochlea is originally ectoderm. from the neuroectoderm which is an ectodermal tissue. It's the same thing like the iris and the retina. You can find black dots because they originate from the ectoderm. Then we have the eustachian tube and the anterior epitempanum. This is the processus cochlearyformis and the head of the magus and the tensor tympani muscle. We're going to move the satellite now. <coughs> Thank you.
Labyrinthine fascia called Bill's bar. This is the superior vestibular, and this is the fascia right there, and Bill's bar in between. down to the tip of the mastoid. Okay? This is the latter semicircular canal, the head of the main. This is all the way anterior. You're going to see the middle meningeal artery. This, when exposing the middle cranial fossa approach, you are actually working between three major bloody structures. The middle meningeal artery, the uh, superior petrosal sinus, and medially you can get also reach the, the area uh, of the uh, sigmoid sinus. And here's the internal pituitary canal. This is the beauty of the microscope that you can see your back. And now we have carried out surgical bombing where we showed all the structures which are present inside the uh, temporal bone. I like especially to stress on that. Your eyes should take care of fissure there. Internal pituitary canal, labyrinthine, first gene tympanic part, second genome, and then the mastoid part is going all the way down to the stylo-mastoid form. So, does anybody really want to have this x-ray in your centers? Does it have any value? No value whatsoever. I'm still astonished that some surgeons insist that the patient in preparation should have a mastoid x-ray. This is not cost-effective at all. You don't get any information from this x-ray. You don't have to have a CT scan for every patient, for example, with a simple perforation. You already see that clinically. You always should think of an investigation that it is going to add information to you. So if you're going to limit our investigation, CT scan and MRI, to patients that deserve it and are indicated, and then you're going to find that you're not going to cost your medical system. But if you're going to do a mass work stay like that, without any benefit whatsoever, it's not going to benefit your patient whatsoever. Uh, this is Borger Riyar. I just wanted to show you one last slide. I'll have to get it uh, by itself. Seems I lost it. No, I lost it. Okay, no problem. If I find it, I'll show it to you next time. <laughs> and maybe if you do it like that.
this is the one. Okay, this is what I saw once in the OR. They were doing, a, they were having a Kostetoma case, and they asked me to come in to uh, to help them because they had troubles. So I came in and I saw that when I first entered the OR, I saw this CT scan of the patient placed in the garbage can. And I told them that's why you are unable to do the surgery because the proper place for this is not in the garbage can, it's on the Fanusi Lashaf, on the x-ray box. So please take great care of your CT scans and study your CT scans very well. Thank you.